morning, July 16, 1945, in the desert sands of New Mexico, the world's first atomic bomb was detonated. About six kilograms of plutonium exploded. The resulting fireball, 10,000 times hotter than the sun, lit up the sky. People saw the light or felt the blast for hundreds of kilometers. The power of the nucleus had been unleashed. This is a great way to start our report. Not just your report, but the whole program. In this program, you will need to compare the energy involved in nuclear changes to that of chemical and phase changes. You'll be able to explain why nuclear changes involve so much energy when we solve the case of the missing mass. You will see that unstable nuclei release streams of particles called radiation that can kill, or be used to cure, or to find the age of a rock. And you will see how a scientific discovery in Paris led half a century later to the first application of nuclear energy, fission bomb. To understand nuclear energy, let's compare the difference between nuclear changes, chemical changes, and phase changes. Let's start with a simple phase change, ice to water. Intermolecular forces hold ice molecules together in the crystal lattice. Covalent bonds hold hydrogen and oxygen atoms together in the H2O molecule configuration. Special nuclear forces within each atom keep the nucleus together. Electrons are attracted by adjacent nuclei to result in stable structure. During a phase change from solid to liquid, the intermolecular forces are disrupted or broken down, destroying the crystal lattice. Energy applied to melt the ice is stored in the water molecules as potential energy. Helen, how can we compare the energy of a phase change to that of a chemical change? Well, the energy involved in the phase change would probably be less than that in the chemical change, wouldn't it? That's right. We can look at water as an example. The phase changes occur at 0 degrees Celsius and 100 degrees Celsius. If we keep heating water after it's vaporized at 100 degrees Celsius, eventually the water vapor will reach 2,000 degrees Celsius, at which point a chemical change will start to occur. Now, Helen, what does that mean, chemical change, in terms of water molecules? Well, a chemical change is when atoms are rearranged because of the breaking and forming of chemical bonds, right? That's right. At 2,000 degrees Celsius, the covalent bonds holding the hydrogen and oxygen atoms together in water molecules begin to come apart, begin to break. Now, the energy that does this is stored as potential energy in the now separated hydrogen and oxygen atoms. Only electrons are involved in the breaking and forming of chemical bonds. The protons and neutrons are not rearranged. Good. Can you sum up the differences between chemical and phase changes? Well, in the chemical change, the electrons are involved in the breaking and forming of bonds, and atoms are rearranged. In the phase change, the molecules are simply separated from each other as intermolecular forces are overcome. Good. What about energy? Well, the energy in the chemical change would be generally greater than the one in the phase change. That's right. Let's assume we've collected some hydrogen from the last chemical change we were talking about. The hydrogen atoms remain intact until the temperature approaches 100 million degrees Celsius. At these enormously high temperatures, the hydrogen atoms may undergo a nuclear change. Protons from two hydrogen nuclei can fuse and form a new element, helium. Is that what's called a nuclear fusion, like what happens in the core of the sun? That's right, although fusion isn't the only nuclear reaction that occurs in the sun and all stars. Helen, sum up the differences between nuclear reactions and chemical and phase changes. Well, in a nuclear change, the nuclear particles are rearranged to form new atoms. And in a chemical change, the electrons are rearranged to form new molecules. But in a phase change, the molecules and atoms both stay intact. That's right. Just like in chemical and phase changes, we can represent it with a reaction equation. We can do the same with nuclear changes. A nuclear reaction equation starts with the symbols for each element. And then atomic numbers are added. The atomic number represents the number of protons in the nucleus of each atom. Then we write in the mass numbers. Now, the mass number represents the total number of protons and neutrons in each nucleus. Notice that the two hydrogens are different. That's because they are isotopes of hydrogen. Now, an isotope is when you have atoms of the same element with different mass numbers. Our first hydrogen has a mass number of one. Now, that means that it contains only the one proton in its, in its nucleus. The second isotope of hydrogen, however, has a mass number of two. Now that means, in addition to the one proton, it also contains one neutron. Now to balance these, the sums of the mass numbers on both sides have to be equal, and 
the sums of the atomic numbers on both sides have to be equal. Are protons the only particles that are involved in a nuclear change? No, there are many others, specifically the neutron, like I just mentioned. Here, let me show you. Here's the symbol for a neutron. It has an atomic number of zero, of course, because there's no protons and no nucleus, but its mass number still is one to represent itself. So, writing a nuclear energy reaction is quite a bit different than writing one for a chemical change or a phase change, although the energy can still be included as a term in each of the three. Now, the energy involved in nuclear changes is far greater than that of chemical or phase changes. Have a look at these potential energy diagrams. The first one represents a phase change. The enthalpy change is in the tens of kilojoules. A typical chemical change, the enthalpy change is in hundreds of kilojoules. But for a nuclear change, the enthalpy change is on the order of billions of kilojoules. In our opening sequence, you saw the huge amount of energy involved in nuclear reactions. How huge is huge? Consider this analogy. If we can represent the typical phase change energy by the thickness of this tissue paper, then the energy of a typical chemical change could be represented by the thickness of this stack of papers. Well, the energy of a typical nuclear change would be represented by this. Hey, Kathy! How you doing up there? of you. The energy of a nuclear change is represented by this 37-story building. A quantity 10 to the 7th times greater than that of a phase change, represented by this tiny piece of tissue paper. Let's see why nuclear changes involve so much energy. What are you doing? I'm attempting to solve the case of the missing moss. But what does it have to do with nuclear changes? Well, it's, it's elementary. Matter and energy are interconvertible. You mean matter can be changed into energy? How do you know that? Well, that's a mystery that Einstein solved. Albert Einstein, the famous 20th century physicist, shows that a quantity of mass is equivalent to a quantity of energy. He calculated this through his now famous equation, E equals mc squared. So if we solve the case of the missing mass, will we also see what happens to the energy? Quite. All right, Inspector, where do we start? Well, let me show you. I deduced that when one mole of helium-4 is produced from two moles of hydrogen and two moles of neutrons, in fact, the mass of the products is less than the mass of the reactants. And I've got some preliminary calculations to support my thesis. When one considers the, so, the, the sum total mass of the reactants, here, and compares that to the total mass of the products, there, you can see that there's a precise difference of 0 0.02928 grams. Hold on, this makes no sense. I thought mass was supposed to be conserved, but here, the mass of the products and the mass of the reactants are different. I thought they should be the same. <laughs> that would be the case in a phase change or a chemical reaction. Not a nuclear change? <laughs> not at all, not at all. You see, the mass that is lost is converted to energy, and that is what is released by the nuclear reaction here. Well, well done, Inspector. You've solved the case of the missing mass. Hmm, but how much energy is released when the mass is converted? Well, that we can determine using Einstein's famous energy-mass relationship, the formula E equals mc squared. And it's with this we can determine the energy that is produced when one mole of helium is created from two moles of hydrogen and two moles of neutrons. Hmm. Well, I know that the E equals the energy and the M equals the mass, but mm -hmm. I'm not too sure quite about right, the C. Right. Ah, the C is the speed of light. So let's carry on here. The missing mass, 0 0.02928 grams, will be multiplied by the speed of light, which we all know is 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And of course, this is all squared. But there's one other thing we should look at. The unit grams should be converted to kilograms. And that way, when we multiply our missing mass by the speed of light squared, we will determine the energy that is produced by this nuclear reaction. These units don't look all that familiar to me. <laughs> Can't we use kilojoules as the unit of energy? <laughs> ah, but you see, kilogram times meter squared per second squared, in fact, is a joule. 
Essentially, our answer is already expressed in joules. So you can convert joules into kilojoules. This means 2,630,000,000 kilojoules per mole. Yes, per mole of heat formed, in fact. That's a lot of energy. Mm, quite right. As a matter of fact, this might help illustrate just how much energy it is. When this energy is produced from the production of helium, and mind you, it's only four grams, four grams. The energy that is released is enough to keep this 100 watt light bulb burning for almost 900 years. <sighs> wow, that's a lot. Mm, quite. Okay, we've seen the loss of mass and the, and the how it was changed into energy, mm -hmm. and uh, how helium, the helium nucleus was formed. But what happens if the nucleus is broken? Mm, good, good point. Actually, it would require the input of a tremendous energy, at least 2.63 times 10 to the ninth kilojoules, and that would then be enough to break up the nucleus into its protons and its neutrons. And this energy that you add is referred to as the nuclear binding energy. I can see why the helium nucleus is so stable. Mm, quite, quite. As a matter of fact, the stronger the nuclear binding energy, the more stable the nucleus is. Which leads me to an interesting question. I wonder what it would be like if we pondered what would happen if we had an unstable nucleus. The stability of the nucleus depends upon a ratio of protons to neutrons. A large imbalance in the ratio results in an unstable nucleus. An unstable nucleus loses energy and may emit particles or electromagnetic radiation. This spontaneous disintegration of a nucleus is called radioactivity. When a radioactive nucleus disintegrates, are the products formed also unstable? Well, they may be unstable. Therefore, they will undergo further disintegration or radioactive decay. Every radioisotope has the characteristic rate of decay measured by its half-life. A half-life is the time required for one half of the atoms of a radioisotope to emit radiation and decay to products. How long does it take to decay? Well, various stages of the decay series could take mm, billions of years or a few days or minutes. Now, this process of radioactive decay is repeated until a stable, non-radioactive product is finally formed. After one half-life, one half of the original radioactive atoms have decayed into atoms of a new element. The other one half remain unchanged. And after a second half-life, one quarter of the original radioactive atoms remain. So what can we apply this to? Well, decay of radioactive isotopes are used as atomic clocks for dating ancient rocks and artifacts. Scientists can take an object such as this rock, measure the amounts of particular isotopes in the object, relate this to the isotopes have lives, and determine the age of the rock. How old is that one? Well, this rock is three and a half billion years old. Wow. Pretty old. Mm -hmm. Now, the stability of a radioisotope is indicated by its half-life. The longer the half-life, the more stable the isotope. Many artificially produced radioisotopes are highly unstable and have very short half-lives. But this feature is a great advantage in nuclear medicine because rapidly decaying isotopes are not long-term biological radiation hazards. In 1896, Henri Becquerel was studying uranium compounds that became fluorescent after gathering sunlight. By chance, the Paris weather turned cloudy during his investigations. He put the uranium compound in his desk drawer near a well-wrapped, unexposed photographic plate. A few days later, as he was developing other plates, Becquerel also developed this wrapped and presumably unexposed plate. To his amazement, it showed a distinct spot that indicated intense exposure. Several types of radiation can be emitted during radioactive decay. One type is alpha radiation, which consists of helium nuclei that have been emitted from the nucleus of a radioactive element. Alpha particles are easily stopped by paper, skin, light clothing, or even a few centimeters of air. A second type is beta radiation, which consists of high energy electrons emitted from the nucleus when a neutron disintegrates. It takes a sheet of metal, dense wood or heavy clothing to stop beta particles. A third type is gamma radiation, 
which is a form of high energy electromagnetic radiation like x-rays. Even more deeply penetrating than alpha and beta particles, gamma rays pass through most substances with ease. Blocking them requires thick walls of concrete or lead. We'll soon understand how radiation has the power to cure some illnesses and prolong lives. But first, we have to look at how radiation poses danger to living things. What kind of dangers? This depends on both the radiation's ability to penetrate tissue and its ability to disrupt the tissue once it has penetrated. Alpha particles have enough mass to damage whatever cells they collide with, but they're so big that they're easily stopped by other chemical particles. They can do considerable damage in the short distances that they travel. As an analogy, you might think of a narrow alleyway, garbage bins strewn around, and assorted obstacles on the street. The alpha particle would be like a large garbage truck, and it wouldn't get very far. But it would still do a lot of damage over the short distance traveled, wouldn't it? That's right. Now, the beta particle would be like a small sports car, speeding recklessly along. It might get farther along in the alley with fewer collisions and less damage. But it still wouldn't get very far. No, it wouldn't make it all the way through. A motorbike, the gamma ray, would be more likely to get all the way through the clutter at the other end of the alley. With only minor damages, of course. That's right. Now, radiation passes through living matter much like the vehicles in the crowded alleyway. It encounters and collides with a variety of molecules, ranging from the simple water molecule to the more elaborate DNA molecule. Large doses of radiation can damage living tissue, enough to cause illness or death. The more immediate results of the damage range from reduced white blood cell counts with symptoms such as fatigue, nausea, and even painful death. The delayed effects appear as damage to glands, such as the thyroid gland, organs, such as the colon and liver, or even bone marrow. The effects may also show up in an increased incidence of leukemia and other cancers. Damage to the reproductive system results in increased numbers of offspring born with physical disabilities or weakened immune systems. Becquerel's accidental discovery of this new form of radiation was taken up by two of his graduate students, Pierre and Marie Curie. They were able to show that the fogging of the plate was caused by rays emitted by the uranium in the ore. Marie Curie named the phenomenon radioactivity. Together with Becquerel, the Curies shared the 1903 Nobel Prize in Physics. After her husband's death in 1906, Marie became the first woman to teach at the Sorbonne. In 1911, she became one of only three scientists in history to receive a second Nobel Prize for her work in the isolation of the radioactive elements radium and polonium. During and after World War I, Dr. Curie was a pioneer in the chemical and medical applications of radioactive substances. So we're here to see the slowpoke, so what exactly is that? Okay, well the slowpoke is, uh, is the name for the nuclear reactor that we have here. It's a research reactor and the name Slowpoke stands for Safe Low Power Critical Experiment. And it was designed by the Atomic Energy of Canada Limited for uses or usage in universities and hospitals. So how are Slowpoke reactors used in the medical field? Well, one of the beauties of the Slowpoke is that you can produce radioactive uh, isotopes or radionuclides which are short-lived. That means that they decay away quite quickly quickly and being on site or close to the hospital we can make isotopes or elements radioactive they can be brought over to the hospital and they can be used immediately once they're used they then decay away rapidly and therefore the patient is not subjected to a long-lived sort of radioactive isotope what main radioisotopes are produced and how are they used okay if the again I say we tend to produce some of the shorter lived isotopes because we are on, are on site for the hospital and for industry and typically in the medical usages a common isotopes produced are sodium 24 which is a half-life of uh, a little bit less than 15 hours and potassium 42 which is a half-life of just over 12 hours now potassium and sodium are essential elements in the body and are very important with regard to blood pressure and electrolyte levels etc so by using these you actually can mimic uh, the behavior of natural sodium in the body and, and natural potassium so these can be sort of injected and then they can be imaged or sampled and analyzed and you can get a lot of information from that we have here what's called a fission reactor and we'll go down and have a look at the reactor okay. 
Okay, well this is the slow poke reactor and it's a little bit anticlimactic because you really can't get to see much because the reactor itself is covered with these uh, high density concrete blocks which actually act as a biological shield. The reactor itself is underneath here in a pool which is of, of water which is about 20 feet deep and the reactor core is actually at the bottom of that pool and the water acts as a shield in the concrete. So as I say, the reactor for us is just a source of neutrons. One of the things about cobalt is it's one of the very first uh, radioisotopes that we started using for external beam treatment of cancer. In other words, treating the patient with a piece of radiation that is outside of the, of the patient's body. And it's been uh, around since about 1950. How is it used today? Well, we use it for cancers that are not too deep within the body, things like cancer of the larynx, uh, cancer or the spinal cord where we don't have to penetrate too deeply into tissues because uh, cobalt-60 uh, is not as energetic as some of the newer technology we have now in our linear accelerators. Could you explain the operation of cobalt-60 in the Theratron? Well, what we would do is it would be predetermined exactly what we wanted to treat on our patient and we would know the types of uh, field sizes and angles that we would want to treat the patient from. So we would lie the patient down on this particular bed swing the patient under the machine. Now in this system here, there's a diaphragm system and we can adjust that to different kinds of field sizes. We can raise and lower the bed to different distances. When we're set and when we think we have the tumor placed exactly where we want it, we would go out of the room, turn the machine on, and a small pellet of radiation would slide forward so that the patient would be exposed to the radiation. How long does a cobalt-60 pellet last? Well, as you know, cobalt-60 has a half-life of 5 to six years. So if we were to leave this in for an extended period of time, the treatments would gradually get longer and longer and our patients would have to remain on the table longer. So we replace this pellet of radiation about every three to five years just so that we can keep its activity level up. Oh, well, thank you. Thanks. Helen and Stephanie have shown us how scientists use nuclear reactions to treat disease. Now the two types of nuclear reactions, fission and fusion, have tremendous implications on humanity. The energy that's released by both of these processes could be used to destroy us, or it could be used to provide large quantities of energy for peaceful purposes. Now, fission reactions, the nucleus of a large atom is split into smaller fragments, releasing energy in the process through the conversion of mass to energy. Well, we learned that fission was discovered in the late 1930s when the uranium nucleus was bombarded by neutrons and split into two lighter elements. And this process released 26 million times more energy than the combustion of an equivalent quantity of gasoline. That's right, and this might help illustrate. If we took one gram of uranium and released the energy from that, it would be enough to keep this light bulb going for about 100 years, whereas the energy from an equivalent mass of gasoline would only keep the bulb burning for about eight minutes. Yeah, but how do you put the gasoline into the light bulb? Yeah. <laughs> sure. Well, we learned that the first application of nuclear fission was in the development of the atomic bomb. During World War II, the Allies and the Nazis were in desperate competition to be the first to harness atomic power. Yeah, and both sides believed that building a successful atomic bomb would mean the difference between victory and defeat. Well, after an intense research effort, a plutonium bomb was exploded over the sands of New Mexico. And in 1945, shortly after this test, two bombs, one uranium and one plutonium, were exploded over the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. This caused tremendous human suffering, and shortly after, World War II had ended. After the war, the energy of nuclear fission was used to, was applied to the production of electricity. And the initial promise was cheap, plentiful electricity that was produced by a fuel that would be free of smog, smoke, and other pollutants that results from burning coal, oil, and gas. And because such small quantity of fuel are required, the supply of nuclear power could last thousands of years. Nuclear reactors were designed in which controlled fission would occur. In a nuclear reactor, it is possible to tame the same reaction that was used in the atomic bomb to release enormous quantities of energy in a controlled manner. Mm -hmm. How does a reactor actually work? Well, we have to remember that the nuclear fission reaction now releases energy that is eventually converted to electrical energy. Let's have a look at this diagram. Uranium fuel rods are placed in the reactor core. Mobile control rods slide up and down among the uranium rods to control the rate of fission. A heat transfer liquid 
often water under very high pressure circulates through the core to cool it and carry the generated heat to the steam turbine. The turbine drives the generator which produces electricity. Initial promise soon gave way to problems and fears mm -hmm. and, uh, that have slowed the widespread use of nuclear power. Um, several factors have contributed to the fading of the stream. Yeah, and among those are um, questions of safety and um, high operating costs and safe disposal of nuclear wastes. For example, where exactly are we supposed to put them all? Mm -hmm. yeah. Obviously, there's still a great deal of controversy over the use of nuclear power. Large quantities of energy are also produced by fusion. In nuclear fusion, a transformation resembling the reverse of fission is the process of combining two light nuclei to form a heavier, more stable nucleus. Yeah, and nuclear fusion also results in the conversion of matter to energy. Right. The sun's energy comes from a fusion reaction that converts hydrogen to helium. Mm -hmm. And all the elements are believed to have been created by a fusion of hydrogen um, into larger nuclei. Right. Well, if there's so much energy in fusion, why don't we harness it to make electricity to run my disk player? A nuclear power disk player? Well, <laughs> okay. I know what you mean. And hydrogen is definitely very plentiful, so the development of a successful nuclear fusion reactor would supply us with almost unlimited quantities of energy. Unfortunately, as we say, there are some technical difficulties, and one of them is that this reaction occurs at tremendous temperatures in the millions of degrees Celsius, and so far we don't have any structural materials that can stand these temperatures. The second difficulty is getting these hydrogen nuclei close enough together to fuse because there's a natural repulsion between those nuclei. Progress has been made, but so far no one's been able to come up with a successful and practical and operational nuclear fusion reactor. Don't worry, our generation will think of something. <laughs> but in the meantime, I guess it's back to batteries. In our report, we trace the path from the discovery of radioactivity to nuclear bombs to nuclear electrical generating stations. We've also learned that radiation can cause illness or death or it can save lives. Yeah, and we've also compared energy differences between chemical change, phase changes, and nuclear changes. And we can use this energy to benefit us or harm us, depending on how, on how we choose to use it. People saw the light or felt that blast for hundreds of kilometers. The 31 meter tower holding the bomb vaporized. The desert sands below the melted, below melted the glass, melted two glass. So, writing a nuclear energy reaction is quite a bit different than writing one for a chemical change or a phase change, although the energy can still be included as a term in each of the three. Now, the energy involved in nuclear changes is far greater than that of chemical or phase changes. And what kind of danger? Well, this depends on both the radiation's ability to penetrate tissue and its ability to disrupt tissue once it has penetrated. Now, alpha particles have enough mass, uh, enough mass to damage whatever cells they can collide with. We've seen the loss of mass changed into, uh, uh, into energy as the helium nucleus is formed. What happens if the nucleus is broken? Mm, well, that would take a lot of energy. In fact, an input of at least 2.63 times 10 to the 9th kilojoules per mole. 